Can your startup be among the ranks of those who will go into space? That is something you will learn at our next session. Innovative projects and startups on the International Space Station. A look through the space station's glass. We are joined by Alexander Chernov, Skolkova Foundation, who will be moderating the session. It is my honor to welcome our guest, Anatoly Ivanishin, hero of the Russian Federation, Russian cosmonaut. Please give him a round of applause. Hello. It is also my privilege to welcome Andrei Fedaev, test cosmonaut cosmonaut with Roscosmos. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. And it is my privilege to welcome a cosmonaut who joins us from the IASS, Peter Dubrov, test cosmonaut with Roscosmos. And now I give the floor to Alexander Chernov. Раз, раз, раз. Ребят, вообще фантастика, конечно, да? А где... This is absolutely incredible. And where is the space station right now? Ребят, where should we look at? Фантастика. Мы на связи. That is absolutely unimaginable. Попросить сказать несколько слов председателю. And I would like to give a couple of minutes to Arkady Dvorkovich. Герои. Спасибо вам, что сегодня с нами здесь на земле и одновременно в космосе. Thank you so much for being with us, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and it is such a great honor to welcome our cosmonauts here at Startup Village, because you create technologies that help us here on Earth. And those of you who are now on orbit, I would like to thank you because you really help us, because you do something that we're not even thinking about today. So let us start with some questions to the International Space Stations, and we'll have a short time lag. You know, we have this first question uh, that sounds like this. Whom you wanted to be when you were a child, and I'll skip that. So my first question is, what innovative technologies are used at the ISS? Well, first of all, good morning, good morning, Skolkova, good morning to all of the participants. Well, that is a very big question. And I should probably start by saying that the first technology that we're working on now is the technology of um, polarized loads. Before everything that we took here, after it served its term, was here just like some load. Currently, we can take all of the technologies that we want to test, and after uh, this equipment is no longer needed, it can be replaced with the new one. So it gives us an opportunity to work on all the new technologies that we want to work on. Some more technologies are, for example, laser, space communication. We will be installing new equipment during our next expeditions, and of course our new module will be following all of the requirements to this new changeable loads. Another technology that I would like to mention is bioprinting. So lots and lots of technologies. Thank you. The next question that we have, what experiments are you currently conducting in low Earth orbit? Только на нашу экспедицию запланировано выполнение 
48 научных экспериментов. We have 48 experiments to do, and I'm only speaking about our expedition, and it would not make any sense to enlist all of them. But I will mention some of them. So. The first one is City Macnarium, that is a pretty fancy name. So what we do is we study behavioral patterns and adaptation patterns of flies, of pretty common flies, so we'll be studying some of their very special cells, which enable them to adapt very quickly to space environment, and probably that will give an additional impetus to help develop new technologies which will help people to adapt to the space environment much quicker. And of course, we are conducting a number of experiments on the human body in the space environment. Thank you. А какой бытовой техникой вы пользуетесь? You know what I would like to know? Do you use some household appliances aboard the ISS? Like, I don't know, a coffee machine or a juice maker? What do you use? Maybe a dishwashing machine? Well, as you understand, the ISS is unique and the equipment that we use here is unique too. We do not have washing machines or dishwashers, but we have our very special household appliances. One of them we are using to cook meals and to fill uh, the bags with already cooked meals. We also use scissors and knives Something that we would use on Earth, too. And we have a unique water supply system here. It uses liquid from cold air. After that, it is reused for cooking. And we also use some of our newest technologies. For example, we uh, regenerate human urine to make water and that is something that will be probably used during future space travels. Now we do experiments on that. Okay, my next question is, what are the new devices? What are the new pieces of equipment that you use now at the ISS that will soon serve all of the humanity, if you can answer that, of course. It goes without saying that everything that we use here in space is designed to be used on Earth and during future space travels. So virtually every technology that we test right now in space, I believe, will be in future used on Earth with necessary conditions, of course. For example, laser communications technology is something that we can use on Earth in the future. And it will give us a lot of opportunities to improve the quality of communication and its security patterns. All of the adaptation technologies that we are currently discovering here in space probably will be applied on Earth, for, for example, to help people rehabilitate after a serious trauma or an injury. So everything that has to do with coming back to health, with being on demand after a trauma or an illness, I think that can benefit greatly from uh, experiments that we conduct here at the ISS. So virtually every technology that we use now in space will be uh, will be successful on Earth. Well, we seem to be talking a great deal about hardware, about equipment. It goes without saying that a space flight has a toll on your emotional state. So what do you do to help your mind and your body um, in space and after you're back on Earth?
Не только вид из иллюминатора уже помогает не только... You know, sometimes it suffices to take a look out and to look at our dear planet Earth because the look of it is absolutely breathtaking. It suffices to look at the clouds. They're never the same. No matter how many times you look, you see continents and seas and lakes. From up here, they look very different from what we're used to on Earth. So it helps a lot to look out of the window and to look at our planet. We have uh, our own library of books and music. We would often spend time together uh, with our foreign colleagues. Sometimes we do that in our segment, sometimes in theirs. And that helps a lot to relieve the pressure that we feel. Because it goes without saying that when we are here at the ISS, it is our home with our everyday life, with our everyday routine. And that helps us, you know, to brace ourselves. Thank you. You know, our director has just told me that you are actually a programmer, a coder. So probably in another lifetime you would be here at Startup Village looking for investors. But you've become a cosmonaut. So what did influence your life choice? What was it? Well, I think I dreamt about becoming a cosmonaut way before I became a software engineer. When I was a child, I was like four or five years old when I read Leonov's book, Entering Space, and that book was my inspiration. It was, well, the reason why I started dreaming about space. I lived in a far city in the region of the Russian Far East. There was no way for me to actually achieve my dream back in the day. So when I had to choose whom I want to become, I decided to become a software engineer. It was a down-to-earth decision, a workable decision because I knew I can become someone if I study software engineering. But then, one day I saw that the Russia Space Agency started looking for new cosmonauts, and I, and I knew that they were looking for not only for pilots or engineers, they needed also computer specialists. And I thought, well, that's my ticket to space. There is a lot of computer equipment here. We have five different systems here with their own individual CPUs on board of the ISS. I know these things. I know how to work them. I know how to troubleshoot these equipment. So I did my best. I started preparing for this test, and I was lucky enough to make it all the way to this place, to the ISS itself. Correct me if I'm wrong, there are seven people on board the ISS, right? And I know that sometimes you need to, well, sleep. Do you sleep well? Do you have dreams? Is it comfortable to sleep in space? Of course we need to sleep, but all the usual things are quite unusual here. We can just lie down and relax, we cannot just, you know, move your body around on the mattress. We are hanging here in zero G. Our hands, all the things around, they are flying. It was hard to get accustomed to this, but I got a grip 
on it. Some use, you know, belts. I just located my sleeping bag in such a way as it would help me to feel like I'm down here on Earth. It just presses me against the wall a little bit. In a couple of days, you get accustomed. You don't notice it, actually. You're just hanging up in the, well, not air, in zero G. But sometimes when I wake up, I still sometimes think in my head, whoa, where am I? You're pressed against the wall, you're flying in the air, basically. You can orientate yourself. In a moment or two, you wake up fully and you know where you are and well that's it do you want to say something to us something special for all the people here there's one thing i'd like to wish to all of you I hope all your dreams will come true, even the earliest dreams, maybe the dreams you haven't dreamt yet, all of them, I wish you to help achieve innovative, fantastic, brazen and ambitious, all of them, I wish all of your dreams will come true because you will have your chance wait for it prepare for it be prepared to seize your opportunity this is our space pilot Piotr Dubrov on board ISS the ISS is crossing the Urals and we're losing connection but it's not a problem because we have a lot of people here to continue Anatoly and Andrei. Okay. Have you participated in any kind of research that was later on translated down here to Earth? Something which was used later on here on Earth? Okay, let's break it down in two. In my last flight, I did participate in an experiment which calls 3D by printer. I think that's something which has been widely discussed today and uh, this experiment dealt with printing tissue in space because there is a couple of ways to do 3D printing and we tested all of it because some of it requires you know supporting structures which help you to form that thing that you are printing as some say this is a slow way to do it and the structures itself they sometimes biodegrade they can be toxic we have a different solutions tested it was provided by 3d bioprinting solutions this new technology does not require any supporting structures you can do 3d bioprinting using special chemicals. This is a very fast way to do 3D printing of tissue. We've been actually doing this experiment starting in 2017. First, we did only a small sample. We printed a part of tissue for rats. And the experiment I participated in is interesting because all the previous stages ended in space. So we printed something, we brought it down to Earth and was later on studied by professionals here. But the one I took part in, it was planned that after I come back with the components printed on the ISS, and that was bone tissue made from non-organic materials. It, it sounds like rocket science, but it's not. So all, all these samples, they were expected to be transplanted to animals. That was the first experiment of its kind. So this company wants to test flat structures first. It's like skin tissue. Later on, it will be something more than that. It will be porous materials or tubes. Well, we know what kind of tubes we have. Veins, arteries. And then 
liver, kidneys. There is a lot of areas where you can apply these technologies. Of course, when these technologies will be, well, ready to be used in mass. It's fantastic. Yes, that was a breakthrough. Yes, it is a breakthrough. It's very promising, but as any other promising technology, it requires a lot of work and time. We are not, you know, specialists in 3D printing or biology. We thus don't have too much access to the results regarding the end of our experiment, unfortunately. But I'm sure that this was not the end of it. These experiments will continue, and one day we'll have unique things happening. We will know it, because it's Kolkova company. It's incredible. Our guys here, they asked our cosmonauts to do an experiment which helped us to make a breakthrough. Because printing tissue for rats is something out of this world. Everyone was buzzing about that. It was a major leap forward. And thank you for helping it make it happen. Now, my second question is less technologically intensive. What are the things which you miss? I mean, those things up there in space. You surely miss something, don't you? Low G, zero G, looking through the pothole on our planet. That's something I do miss. Low G, zero G environment is a tricky thing. Our life up there is very different. Zero G gives you a lot of opportunities. For example, in zero G, you can do a lot of new things, but there is always but. It also takes toll on your body because all the fluids they run in different ways, and people who come from space they don't feel too well for some time because well it takes time to get accustomed to. It's a physiological issue, no? You have to first get accustomed to space. After that, you have to get accustomed to not being in space. Up there, we don't walk, we fly. If we need something. Like when we do something up on the station, or when we are going to the station, we are flying. All the things we do, we do flying. This station, the ISS, is a huge structure. More than 10 modules, some of them Russian, some of them American. And actually, Russia's modules have Russian equipment. America's modules have Rush, not Russian, but American, Canadian, Japanese equipment, all sorts of equipment. Yes, we technically have floor and ceiling and walls, but most of the time we are moving in one fashion. The floor is down. But sometimes we are flying backwards. I mean, we are moving with our head towards the ceiling. Sometimes we do it like vice versa. We have our head towards the floor. And when we have to orient ourselves inside the station, we're moving like fish, head first to like a bird, head first. If we, and to know where we're heading, we use the direction of our flight to communicate. We use our Earth words. I mean, let's go. Don't say let's fly, OK? Up there, everything is flying around you. When we do maintenance or servicing, when you have to unbolt something, unscrew something, deep install, install, that creates a lot of problems. You have all sorts of screws flying around, and they create a cloud. And you need to take good care, because if the things get lost, you won't find them, never. And to keep them all, we use tape. We put it on us, this tape, and we glue all the things which are unscrewed to ourselves. Now, there are some peculiarities with food. Some components have to be consumed in the form which they have been delivered. These are sublimated or conserved food, but you need to fasten it well. Otherwise, it will fly away from you. And we use, again, tape to glue these things, any kind of object. 
can fly from you. If you leave it in space, flying in front of you, you turn your back to it, you turn around and it's gone. You cannot fasten something because sometimes it's too hard to do that. There, there are, you know, ventilators there. Ventilators, yes, ventilators, they can just create enough air pressure to move an object through your room, through your module. That is why things that you leave hanging in the, in the air in zero G won't stay where they are. My American colleague once said that when he came back to Earth, he used to leaving cups with coffee in front of him. So he broke a couple of cups this way because he, he, he used to leave them hanging in front of him in space. And that's true. You can leave your cup in front of you in the air, but still you need to keep good track of it because otherwise it will fly away. You, you, you'll have a problem. That's just one of the, you know, peculiarities. Just as sleeping. Sleeping is interesting. We are sleeping standing. Not because we want to. That's because we have to. You can, can't sleep lying on anything. You have small cabins up there. When you are relaxed, your legs and your arms are usually a little bit compacted to you. You keep them close. And this way you can find a comfy place, a comfy pose, and actually have a good night's sleep. We have sleeping bags to limit our movement, because without sleeping bags we'll be just going all the way around the cabin. Also these sleeping bags help us to maintain good temperature. Without sleeping bags it was a problem. You probably heard that there was a leakage at the station. An American control room woke up, up at 3 o'clock in the morning. They thought the leakage was causing too much airflow when we turned on the emergency mode. We had to work hard and we had to close the Russian segment. We had to close everything down and our cabins, they were closed as well. We went to our colleagues and they had no sleeping bags. And my colleague, his name is Vanya, he was really surprised. We use banjis. These are, you know, like, in, like with bicycle, you, if you have a, the thing to fasten anything, you're good to go. You can fasten anything to your bike. Up there in space, we use these banjis as well, because things are flying and we can fasten them. So Vanya found one of them, and he just tied himself to the wall. We promised a good sleep of three hours, but we could sleep only for an hour or so. But that was a good solution. Okay, you just fasten yourself to the wall. Funny. Now, a question to both of you. What movie about space is the most credible? Don't say Armageddon with Bruce Willis. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, my answer is as follows. I think you many... You, you watched the 13 or something like that. I don't really remember the name. So according to critics and according to astronauts, this is the most credible movie ever created. So no other movie gets that close to reality. Now Interstellar, yeah. Kip Thorne is the author of the idea. He published a book after this. He wrote a book on the science behind Interstellar. In great detail, he explained all the physical processes happening in the movie, all that was filmed, all that was demonstrated. For me personally, there is that paradox, like it's called killing your grandfather. I don't believe in it. I think it's, it's not true. Have you watched The White Sun of the Desert, that old Soviet movie? There is a tradition. I heard that there is a tradition before flying to space, cosmonauts watch The White Sun of the Desert. Interesting, right? Okay, next question now. 
This one is from the internet. It's lonely in space. Do you feel lonely when you are up there above Earth? Do you think it's a problem? Yeah. Two words about movies. I think the most realistic movie is Star Wars. Yes, there are a lot of funny things there, a lot of inconsistencies and basically mistakes, like gravity is one of them. At the beginning of the film, one of the characters is flying around the shuttle. Our partners, they have a good thing, it's called Virtual Reality Lab, where you can fly around. It, it has that safer which is attached to the a helmet and if necessary you can use it because you don't need to fly around the space station you just can use it when you have an emergency out there in space when you're doing any VA it will help you to get to the station so that piece of equipment can help you to come back to the station if you are too far if you're a well trained operator you can actually help yourself. When you're mounting, when we are mounting something during AVA, we need to be careful about the vector of our movement. We need to be oriented towards the station at all times. Sometimes you just need, you know, a centimeter or anything, you, you, and you don't have the juice to make it. And that's when this thing helps. Also, it helps you to break in space. Basically, it helps you to come back when you cannot come back in any other way. And he saved her by the way. Yeah, and the, the female character, she gets from the shuttle to the ISS, and that is not real because we cannot neglect the navigation system. It is a complex device that has various systems. Uh, you have talking and launching mechanisms. And in order to dock spacecraft to the ISS, I mean, that is a complex process. You need to monitor all of the sensors. You need to make sure that the positioning of the spacecraft is 100% correct. And the docking process is only initiated when we see the ISS. And in the movie, they started to do that way too early. So she wouldn't make it. She wouldn't. And a space use is simply not equipped with the systems that would make it possible. And remember this scene where uh, the female character sits there and she thinks she's alone but then her partner comes in and he opens the hatch and he opens the hatch and it leads to the outside but it is not possible because the area of the hatch is around um, one square meter remember about the pressure you simply cannot open the hatch just like that and when we train to open the station. We are clearly instructed to make sure that until the pressure is low enough, we should not attempt to open the hatch. It simply wouldn't batch. And uh, at the same time, I think that it is wrong to criticize a pop science film for not being coherent with the real story. That is not the purpose. It is there to tell you a story, otherwise the film would end. For example, when a shuttle clashes against them, space debris. And speaking about solitude, we have special programs designed for us that we should work through. And so we are busy throughout the day. 
uh, it is not every day that you have some free time and uh, we are really bored because um, by the way at the ISS we can give a call to our friends and what type of phone do you use a Nokia or an iPhone no no it's not like that we have special devices and we use one computer for emails and by the way we hardly ever receive any uh, spam and we have another computer to give phone calls so we do that and sometimes people would not expect it and when we call them and by the way, it doesn't matter for us where the ISS is because every day we move around the Earth, we do the full circle around 15 or 16 times a day and our position changes very quickly. In one moment you are above England, then above France, then above Italy. It only matters if we need to take a snap, a photo of some particular object. But uh, in other cases, when people ask me where you are right now, I mean, I'm left discombobulated. And can you see Skolkova from up there? Well, it's hard to say because our angle is, if I'm not mistaken, if is five is 51.6 degrees and uh, this is not the perfect orbit to look at Moscow and for example when we fly over Manhattan we can look at it so I see, I see. That was the point of positioning the ISS on orbit like this. Well, yeah, you know, currently uh, there are these discussions to uh, to build a Russian space station. Probably it will have a different orbit angle and we'll be able to take Skolkova pictures. So let us now talk about radiation protection because we all know that this is the issue in space it is true that the um, radiation levels in space are somewhat elevated but we are well protected we have special equipment that is installed behind the panels uh, there are special sensors and meters that monitor the current uh, radiation levels. Uh, there is some special equipment that we take with us on spacewalks. There are these devices, you know. Virtually, this is a container with napkins saturated with water. And uh, we use this device to conduct experiments to measure the levels of um, radiation and uh, I believe it would be right to talk about mm, radiation experiments than radiation protection because we have lots of meters and centers that we look at and that we study ladies and gentlemen let's thank Andre Pilter and Anatoly for being with us today because they saw a space with their own eyes. And gentlemen, I ask you to walk through our presentation stands and to look at the startups because they focus on some space solutions. We thank our speakers and the moderator of this session. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, we were eyewitnesses to a unique session at Startup Village 2021. Our international Startup Bazaar station is on orbit now aboard uh, high-tech products surrounded by billions of stars. Founders will be pitching their startups to business angels, partners and clients.
объектов и нарастить базу полезных контактов. Attracting new clients and new people, just like Alexander Chernov just asked our cosmonauts to visit Startup Bazaar, I extend the same invitation to you. Walk through the stands, look at what other startups have to offer, and maybe you will become someone's client. In a couple of minutes, we'll be back here at Global Track to continue the day. Веселье. Жажда путешествий, жажда общения. Утоляй любую жажду с освежающими вкусами Липтон. Мой любимый персик. При низких температурах окружающей среды тела быстро теряют энергию. Но нахождение вблизи источника тепла позволяет телу получать тепловое излучение. Происходит самопроизвольное перераспределение тепла. Следовательно, когда источники тепла находятся вместе, их энергия побеждает холод. Лучшее создается вместе. Газпромбанк. МТС Стартап Хаб. Работа с реальным бизнес-заказчиком МТС. Доступ к ресурсам самого крупного телеком-бренда в России. Не можешь поверить? А в твой стартап обязательно поверят. У нас есть все, что тебе понадобится. Ресурсы, клиенты, технологии, каналы продаж. Мы оценим твой продукт, правильно применим в своем бизнесе и масштабируем на мировой рынок. МТС Стартап Хаб ждет тебя и твоих нереальных бизнес-идей.
Жажда веселья. Жажда путешествий. Жажда общения. Утоляй любую жажду с освежающими вкусами Липтон. Мой любимый персик. При низких температурах окружающей среды тела быстро теряют энергию. Но нахождение вблизи источника тепла позволяет телу получать тепловое излучение. Происходит самопроизвольное перераспределение тепла. Следовательно, когда источники тепла находятся вместе, их энергия побеждает холод. Лучшее создается вместе. Газпромбанк. МТС Стартап Хаб. Работа с реальным бизнес-заказчиком МТС. Доступ к ресурсам самого крупного телеком-бренда в России. Не можешь поверить? А в твой стартап обязательно поверят. У нас есть все, что тебе понадобится. Ресурсы, клиенты, технологии, каналы продаж. Мы оценим твой продукт, правильно применим в своем бизнесе и масштабируем на мировой рынок. МТС Стартап Хаб ждет тебя и твоих нереальных бизнес-идей.